Mixing It, introduced by Mark Russell and Robert Sandal. Mark Russell. Well, we haven't been idle over the summer months. We've been scouring the world for what's interesting in the music scene. And here's just a taster of what we've got tonight. There's an extraordinary five-piece group from Tuva, the South African jazz pianist Beckyum Saleku, an intriguing hybrid called the Sons of Arca, and Britain's own answer to the Captain Beefheart band, the Hat Shoes. But the star of tonight's show is undoubtedly Brian Eno, who explains to us why this track doesn't feature on his new album, Nerve Net. I just didn't feel convinced about it anymore it was it's mainly a, a question of the form of it didn't really excite me the only thing i wish i could release somehow are the synthesizer solos in it with that really really piercing sound sets your teeth on edge from Brian Eno later. And another person who's uh, certainly at a career peak, if not a career best at the moment, is Brian Eno, our special interview of the week. Um, he's, he's just put out a record called Nerve Net, and before that there was a single from it called Fractal Zoom, which some of you may have heard. Now, we had, had a very long, wide-ranging, quite fascinating conversation with him, which went on for several hours. Unfortunately, inevitably, we're only able to replay fragments of it. Um, and... You will hear in, this, in the course of this interview him referring to John Cage, Philip Glass and his music in 12 parts, Steve Reich and many of the other influences that have affected him in what is basically a 25-year career now. But mostly, Eno talked about the music he's interested in and particularly the sounds that he's interested in now. <laughs> Well, they're mostly dirty sounds, anti-Hollywood sounds. <laughs> Wasn't the DX7, though, rather an overexposed instrument? Well, what about the Fender Stratocaster for an overexposed instrument? <laughs> I happened to get one in a particularly dull period of my life where I could think of nothing better to do than to sit and fiddle with my DX7 in this horrible flat I lived in at the time. But I really became completely intuitive with it now. And I have such an easy relationship with it. That's why I carry on working with it. <laughs> Thing that makes synthesizers boring is that it's the sound of a few atoms moving. They move in rather predictable ways and to make them more interesting you have to introduce other levels of complexity. Well it's the opposite way with acoustic instruments you're always struggling to make them less interesting actually. That's to say to make them more controllable. With those kind of instruments you get a lot of um, idiosyncratic information and that makes them work very well in systems music where there's a lot of repetition. 
because the repetition draws your attention to those idiosyncrasies. You know, you hear what's theoretically the same note happening again, but its color is slightly changed. So, so it isn't repetitive, actually. Doing the same thing with a synthesizer, it just is repetitive. <laughs> it's just the same thing happening again, you know. So I, I like to work with complicated inputs. Now, you might say, well, a DX7 isn't that complicated. But it is after I put it through all the rubbish. But aren't you reinventing the wheel by playing with a DX7? I mean, why not? Why not, why not pick not up play one with of the these? piano? Well, two reasons. First of all, they all have cultural resonances that I don't necessarily want. You know, a flute, for instance, has so many meanings built into its very sound, and I don't want them. Oh, I might do sometimes, but generally, you can assume that I don't. A piano is vaguer, fortunately. A piano has such a wide range of associations that it's easier to use. But some instruments are impossible for me to use because they carry too much cultural baggage with them. So what, are, what composers are doing most of the time now is designing their instruments. You know, when people are working in studios, a studio is not a place for mixing music. It's a place for designing your instruments, really. All those little buttons are changing timbre, changing attack, changing decay changing all the things that define what an instrument is. And I've taken this job quite seriously. I usually make my instruments do fairly simple things because the message is in the instrument itself, the, the sound of the instrument itself. That's why I give them funny names on record covers as well. You know, like I, I call things snake guitar or pachydermo caster or something like that because that instrument was made and exists only for that job. And after it's done that, it's, it's redundant. I never bother to write down what it is or anything. I'll never use it again. They become points of departure for making something else. fossil collector when I was a kid. That was my hobby. And fossil collecting, you just really go to a place and you might spend the whole day in a four-yard square area, just scraping away and looking through, finding a little thing and then scraping a little bit more. And I've always had that fossil collector attitude to everything, really. How do you see your musical sort of interests in that light? I mean, do you think of what you've done as a as a four-foot square area that you've been scraping away at, or yeah, I do have in you some moved ways, on? Yeah. yeah, I don't think there are that many different ideas. But even a very small number of ideas can be permutated in a very large number of ways. Which are your favourite ideas? My, I guess my all-time favourite, the one that has dominated more things than any other, is, is the notion of self-creating systems having very few elements and creating um, processes that allow those elements to combine in different ways and then listening to the result of that. But I started doing that before I was doing music. I, I did it visually first in paintings. What excites me is seeing the same few things reclustering and thrown together in different perspectives in relation to each other. If there are too many ele elements, I can't see that any longer. It, it becomes unclear for me. So I'm a minimalist just because what interests me is continually reinvestigating combinations. Does the choosing of the elements, is that part of it that interests you a lot or are you fairly happy to be random with those? No, no, it interests me a lot and that, that's the difference between me and, say, Steve Reich. Steve Reich is a, at least his work from the 60s and early 70s, was very much in the same direction, permutating a small number of elements. All his attention went to the process of permutation and very little to the choice of elements. This was a 60s idea that if you built the right machine you could feed anything into it and it would come out as music at the end. It, it obviously wasn't true, you know. <laughs> I did my dues in the scratch orchestra and in uh, 
the various other experiments that were going on then. And I noticed that some of the results I preferred much, much more than others. So there, there was a connection between inputs and results. It's self-evident, but it wasn't evident then because the whole accent was on creating these conceptual machines of some kind. Cage was a good example, you know, that the machine was the I Ching in his case, chance variations. Put anything into it. But try listening to John Cage's pieces, you know. They don't hold your attention for very long. But one or two of them work. The piano pieces work, for instance. Now that's interesting because the piano is a highly evolved set of sounds. It's not just a random set of sounds. That's something that has a lot of evolution and choice and, you know, things being varied and changed so that they balance up in some way. Of course, my other interest all the time was rock music, where inputs are all important and machine is unimportant, actually. The structure is not even a consideration generally. So the important thing for me was to make processes that I liked, but also to use inputs that I liked. That's why I think discrete music is one of the enduring pieces of minimal music. I mean, it isn't usually regarded as one. A few American critics do consider it to be in the canon of minimalist music, but um, I think that will endure beyond music in 12 parts, which is a completely boring piece of music now, because every, you now understand its, and can locate in history, its innovation. It made its point. Subsequently, people made better music using the same idea. You know, it's a little bit like Stevenson's rocket. You're very pleased he did it, but I wouldn't want to go for a ride in it, you know. <laughs> I was very, very careful with vinyl albums because I assumed that people weren't going to take the needle off. Or at least if they took it off, they weren't going to put it back on. <laughs> so you had to make a continuous listening experience. But with CDs, I mean, people use them like I do. I think, oh, I'm not so keen on that track. Skip to the next one. So because there are suddenly a lot of more formats to release on um, in terms of time length, that means you can have frequent, rather vague, hybrid-type releases coming out, which don't carry the same aura of expectation about them. And secondly, because people can skip tracks, you can afford to put things on that are put there for special interests. You know, like on this new record, I have two versions of the longest track, this song called "Web," and they're right, they're back to back. Now, I don't imagine that a lot of people will sit and listen to both of them. But I do think that a lot of people have a strong preference for one over the other. Now, in the past, I would have had to choose and say, OK, that one goes on, that one doesn't. But now I think, well, let them choose, you know. That's what CDs are for. That's the good thing about them. I'm censoring less, I suppose. Um, I don't care so much. I, I'm quite happy to let people make their choices. And this is a long record. It's 68 minutes, I think, the whole album. So I figure if people find in that 35 minutes, they've got a good deal, you know. That's, um, but it means that different people can have a different album. I want to move away from the album as seen as a novel, you know. I really like what's been happening with the whole remixing movement, where 
several different versions of a song come out. There's the club version, the 12 inch version, the 7 inch version, somebody else's remix of it. And, and suddenly, I, I, I like the idea of pieces of music not having one identity, but, but being very negotiable. You know, there are lots of different forms of them around. You never know whether you've heard them all. That's why Fractal Zoom has come out in all these different versions. I want to make the album seem like just another uh, collection of things, not this is my work as it stands at the moment, because that really that isn't true anyway. Why not release it as, as a series of 12 inches then? Or well, I am. I'm I'm trying to think instead of the novel that comes out every two years. I want to think of it like magazine articles, interviews, pamphlets, novellas. More like work in progress. Yeah. I've more and more come to admire Picasso. He was totally unself-censoring. He just thought, I'm too good for my own understanding. <laughs> He's, I'm sure that was his feeling. He thought, hey, who am I to judge? You know, I just do this stuff. Somebody else can decide whether it's good or not. And Miles I, Davis was a bit like that yes, as well. Yes, absolutely true. I was just saying to someone the other day that those two people were the prime examples this, uh, in this century of that way of thinking, of just saying, look, I do it, you decide. How do you feel about singing at the moment? Um, I don't like it as much as talking. <laughs> you raise the stake broke the soil and phrased the stroke that takes the oil that stoked erased and foiled the lake and smoked and boiled the grazing snake the royal the choke the cakes of praise the spoils that break now cloak the days they wake the coil a blazing coat, the flaking glaze of royalty broke. He praises, stakes, admires, stokes the flowery blaze, the fiery pokes. The Royal and the Choke from Brian Eno's new album on the Opal through Warner's label NerveNet. And you also heard providing sympathetic accompaniment during that interview, tracks from his album Another Green World, Discreet Music and Thursday Afternoon. I think it's very interesting that he's made what I think is one of his most substantial musical albums, Mark. Only two years after he was, he'd virtually given up on making music altogether. It's almost as if he had to move music to the back burner of his mind before he could actually focus upon it again in that curiously indirect way he has of doing things. And it's, it's absolutely packed full of ideas. It's almost like a trawl through his back catalogue. There are bits from various periods of his uh, 
musical life. I, that track, The Roll and the Choke, is, I think it's quite like Here He Comes from Another Green World. But he hasn't made such a direct play for people's attention for quite a long time. No, it, and some of it's very contemporary, the way he's used all these break beats and the, the weird percussion stuff over it. He's obviously influenced by the remixing thing he was talking about. Interesting to hear him talking about sounds. He's someone who's known for his sort of use of technology. And in some ways, I mean, he's still using the DX7, which is nearly 10 years old. But that's what he's always been interested in, the organic aspect of synths. Because he used to use a thing called a VCS3, which didn't even have a keyboard. And the DX7 was the natural success of that. Extremely complex instruments. That The DX7 was actually the first synthesizer that I owned. And it's impossible to program. Underneath this tiny display is this massive potential. So that v that thing, what did you describe it as the VCS3? Was that the thing he played on Virginia Plain? That's right, music? yeah, and he used Be it for ages. That's right, he used it, he told me, he used it all the way through the 1970s. He refused to buy another synthesizer, he just hung on to it. And funnily, it's strange that he should move to the DX7 because that has sort of since come to be known as the serious composer's instrument because it works on additive synthesis, which is layering up sine waves upon sine wave as opposed to subtractive synthesis, which just takes a simple waveform and filters bits out of it. But the, the results of this additive synthesis are extremely unpredictable, and no wonder he's dedicated his time to uh, finding out how it works. What did you think of what he was saying, since you've spent quite a lot of time in recording studios, about the, the recording studio is basically a place where you design your own instruments? Well, I say that's, that's fine if you've got the time. He obviously works at his own speed and is brilliant at doing it, but a lot of people just don't have the time.